God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen, my friends, and amen. A few announcements this morning, as of course you can read along in the your programs this morning, and also see on the screen behind me. First of all, we have visitor cards in the queues. If you're a guest, we'd love for you to fill out one of our visitor cards. That way, one, we can let you know what we're doing here at Mercy Man Methodist Church, but also two, why we do what we do. There are also prayer cards in the queues as well, whether it's a private prayer request or a public, which means we'll place the name or information in our programs. Go ahead and fill one of those cards out and drop it off in the offering plate at that time in the service. And while you're at it, we also have still our inserts on the wild and crazy colors, at least some of them work, for our church works. If there's a word or a thought line or that we use in church as though you're expected to know what it is, or if you want to hear about something, go ahead. Fill out one of these cards out and drop it off in the offering plate. We will talk about it during Lent, which begins on March 1st. In preparation for Lent as well, we also have these free devotionals for Lent, Jesus and the Gospels. They're in the entrances to the sanctuaries. Um, go ahead and take one. They are free for you. Backing up a step, a step, if nothing else, just for Kale's sake. Experiencing God growth groups. We're almost at the end of our growth group season here, although some groups may meet during Lent or March through early April. We'll see what they do. But at least with experiencing God, our growth groups are wrapping up. But if you're still interested in seeing what these things are, it's a great time to check that out. Just make sure you get in touch with one of the leaders or us in the church office if you're interested. Times and places are, of course, on the screen behind me, but go ahead, check it out. It will be worth your time. Marvelous Monday, I'm sorry, skipping ahead, pardon me, youth group tonight, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Next week, we'll have a painting night in the youth room, but that's for most of our youth to know about. Marvelous Mondays is tomorrow night, 5.15 to 7 o'clock. Our kids are now working on their Operation Shoebox, Operation Christmas Child, pardon me, shoeboxes, which we turned in last year for Christmas. Why do you do this? In part of those Operation Christmas Child and Christmas boxes, the shoeboxes go to kids who are needy, whether here in the United States or abroad. Some of the videos you see or stories you hear, some of the kids who receive boxes, that's the only Christmas gift they get. In some ways, that's the way they hear about Jesus Christ because somebody was willing to give them a gift. Talk about a beautiful way to share the love of Jesus. So, if you're interested, check out the details in your programs or see Sandra Rogers or check out by the education office, Sandra's office, if you want more details. The church winter fun day is next Sunday, from 2 to 4 o'clock. $5 for a family to sign up outside the education office for tomorrow night for Marvelous Monday. Sign up then to go. We mostly just need to know how many people are swimming. 5 bucks for a family. We take the place over 2 to 3 o'clock. You can see how many kids it takes to drown the pastor. I've been threatened. And then 3 to 4, the rock climbing wall is open, and the gym is open from 2 to 4 p.m. It should be a great time. If you ordered a strong boy from this preschool for their fundraiser, Wednesday, 3 to 4.30, they'll be delivered and, and able to be picked up here at the church. Make sure you grab yours then if you ordered one. And tomorrow night, beginning at 6.30, the craft group's meeting here at the church for their Light Up Your Life night. If you're interested, check in with the Hutchinsons or call us at the church office. But for $5 to come out for the night, it could be a lot of fun. So that's tomorrow night at 6.30. Friends. Why don't we greet one another with the love of Christ? Is that any better? Yeah. That was Yeah. 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 That's what I was trying to do. It sounded like a doctor with a mask or something. I had that dialed out before and I don't know why. Good morning. Yeah. 
um, number 888, taken from 1 Corinthians 15 and Colossians chapter 1. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one of God, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, in whom all things hold together, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by the power of the Spirit. Christ is the head of the body, in the church, and by the blood of the cross, reconciles all things of God. Amen. Amen. My friends, please be seated.
Anybody got any good news? Anything good jumping out at you? Anything you want to tell me? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> what did you guys make in Sunday school today? You guys weren't there? Like five of you were there. What would you make, Daddy? Pretzels. Chocolate covered pretzels. So I've got some good news. Guess what? I got one. I won't say who gave it to me. Thanks, Jasper. But <laughs> what a gift. Not only that, but mm -hmm, they look good. I didn't even have to steal one to get one. That's some good news. Any other good news? Anything exciting going on? Evan, you're pointing at Derek. Derek, you got good news for us. Really? Oh, sweet. So you're going to have a baby? Awesome. So you, another cousin? Another cousin? Okay. Sweet. That is good news. You ever notice that at times you just can't shut up about good news? Like, I'll see you guys on Monday nights and some of you just you can't stop talking. Yeah, there are some times where we can't shut up whenever it's time to stop talking, huh? Well, can I tell you what the best news is I've ever heard? I guess you don't want to hear it. Okay, we're done. Have a great day. JK, JK. Ruffle, ruffle, mm -hmm. on the floor laughing. Now, best news, can I tell you? We actually spread it oh, this morning whenever we had our um, affirmation. The whole thing that Jesus died for us and he rose from the dead. The best news. The Bible even calls it good news. The best news that we could share. You know, Jesus even actually told us that we're supposed to tell other folks about that. In Matthew chapter 28 puts it this way. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything yeah. I, Jesus, have commanded you. And I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. That reminder is back there at the back of the wall to remind us that God will be with us wherever we go. But part of it is we've got this job to share the best news. So what's that best news? What is that good news? All right, so we'll start over. You guys want to go back there? And we'll start, oh, I'm joking. Best news, Jesus, he died for me. He died for you. He's alive. That is the best news. So let me pray. Father, thank you so much for the best news, this good news about Jesus. Help us to tell others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the Bible, whenever Jesus started calling his disciples, he said, hey, y'all, out there on that boat, we were out fishing. You know what I'm going to make you do? I'll make you fishers of men. In other words, he was saying, I'll help you bring people into my fold. I'll help you bring people into my boat so they might know me, Jesus. So here we go. Because of that, because you guys have a job to do when you leave here today, you tell other folks about Jesus. I've got goldfish. Go ahead, grab two bags. We should have enough. If not, we won't have a world rumble. They won't be good. We'll go ahead and get two bags and make sure you share with somebody. God thanks for this morning. What would you like to praise God for who God is? Is there anything we need to be praying for? Sue. Thanks, Sue, for being intentional about us praying for our country and our leaders. Friends, is there anything else we need to be praying for? Anything you want to thank God for? Praise God for who God is. Marianne. Oh, how cool. And his phone got there. And his phone got there. If you follow on Facebook, Finley forgot his phone, so that had to be shipped out. But beautifully, he's with the grandkids, you know, everybody else, but with the grandkids. Thanks, Marianne. Bob. Big has another 39th birthday on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Kathy. Actually, his baby's youngest sister, she will be 70 on Tuesday. <laughs> oh, Which is far better than the alternative. And, 
Peggy. You won't get the 71 if you do what you want to do right now. I'm just, I'm just saying. I think Jesus would say capital punishment may not be good in this instance. Either way, happy birthday, Peggy. 39 or whatever it is, 39 plus 31. Tuesday, what a gift. Friends, is there anything else you want to give God? Thanks for praise God. Dale. Oh, Terry's got to go and see two doctors this coming week. He's got pneumonia now, and they have to go into his lungs and see if they can get him straightened up. Okay, so keep praying for Dale's brother, Terry, who now has pneumonia, as well as battling the flu. Carrie. Nick's headaches are a little bit better, so for now he decided to hold off on the surgery, but it's scheduled for Friday. Beautiful news. Okay. But keep praying for Nick. Headaches that are coming from nowhere. Yeah, nobody wants that. So keep praying for Nick. Let's put praise be to God for the relief. Okay. Friends, is there anything else you want to give God thanks for? Kathy. Um, I had a request from a friend who lives in Athens, Ohio. But her son has been, he's 45, and diagnosed with colon cancer. And has to go under, um, he's going to go to Cleveland Clinic. Right, so there's worry there. Yes. Okay. So thank you. So be praying for Kathy's friend, whose son Chad is 45 with colon cancer. They're gonna try to shrink the tumor or the cancer, I guess we should say it. And then whatever. And then possible surgery. That'd be my guess. Okay. But it's in a bad spot. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Bob. Did you get the message that Carol Moon's ex-husband passed yesterday? Yes, that um, Richard Moon did pass away yesterday. No, don't know any details, but be praying for the family. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Friends, is there anything else? We want to give God thanks for, praise God for who God is, that we need to be praying for. Then, friends, why don't we go to the Lord together in prayer? But we thank you for sunshine. It's February. We're used to it being gloomy, destructive, snow-covered, not this beautiful spring-like day. We give you thanks. It, it's so hard to be grumpy on a day like today. We give you thanks for the happiness you bring about just because of the sunshine. We know we're wired to be in a better state of mind with the sunshine, but we give you thanks for how it's here. But more than sunshine, we thank you for joy because sunshine, happiness, they can come and go. The dark days are going to come, but... We give you thanks for joy, real joy that you bring about through Jesus. Not the kind of thing where we can bottle up where it's based on our situations, but the joy that comes about because of who you are, that we know whose hands we are in. We give you thanks for joy that you've brought about in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit called joy, and then one of the three greatest gifts. We give you thanks for joy. Father, we've seen your hand at work. We know you're around us. We know you move within us. We know that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us or God amongst us. So we thank you. We thank you that we can sense joy this morning, whether it's when we sing or when we hear or we watch kids. We thank you for joy. We're asking, Father, that you know, we want to thank you for having seen your hand at work. The protection for Finn in the midst of driving. We give you thanks for his safety, Father. We pray for continued safety for him with the grandkids and whatever else this trip might hold for him. Thank you, Father, for the gift that Peggy is. And whatever birthday number it is, we give you thanks, Father, for the gift that she is. Father, we ask that you be with Terry. We pray for healing for him in the midst of his fight and battle with pneumonia, let alone the flu. We pray for healing for him. Father, we live before you. Chad, Kathy's friend's son, who's 45 in Athens, Ohio. We pray for healing for him and guidance in the midst of his colon cancer. Father, move and work. We look before you, Richard Moon's family. We ask you to be with Carol and the family in the midst of this time of grieving. Father, we thank you for the good news about Nick and the relief of the headaches. We're praying, Father, for continued healing and thank you for how you've gotten through so much so far. 
what do you have in store for him? We pray that you might move and work and show it. Father, we come before you in the midst of the joy that we have, realizing that as we watch the news, we see one political party bitter, bickering with another. In transitions of power, we're reminded that whoever we voted for, we're reminded that our hope really isn't in Washington. And yet you've called us to pray for our leaders. So we ask, Father, that you be with President Trump and his cabinet. We ask, Father, that you would be with Congress and the Supreme Court. We ask, Father, that you be with the different departments of government, even those that might be shutting down. We pray that you got them direct. Father, as we look abroad, we see the chaos that goes on, the terror that's occurred in Aleppo, and even as we look at Philadelphia this weekend, the terror that can occur here at home. We're praying, Father, for peace. In Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, North Korea, it becomes harder and harder to even remember everywhere where chaos occurs. We pray for peace in the name of Jesus. We also ask, Father, that closer to home you be with Governor Tom Wolf and our, our state government, as well as our local government, where they are being stretched to the limit in the midst of the struggles that drugs, alcohol, and so many other abuses or substance abuses have torn fabrics of families apart in so many places. Pray for healing. Father, we ask for your hand to move and work. Give our leaders national, state, local wisdom and how to deal with so many issues. Father, when we look at it that way, it's too hard to wrap our minds around. How do we even fix this? And I guess we can't fix this. Not until Jesus comes back. Until that day, we have hints of what's to come. Only hints. And so with the hints of what are to come, with peace, on earth, the hints are to come with the kingdom of God replacing every government here. With the hints that are here now, we thank you that you've given us the hint of the joyful experience because we can even talk about your son. We can even hear about the life that you promised us through your son, Jesus Christ. We want to thank you and praise you with joy in our hearts as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, our sermon texts come from Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 5. I want to give a nice short reading for Robin this morning. That's called sarcasm. There's quite a bit here, but if you can follow along, the reason why we read so much from Acts is because it points to the struggle they had. Morning, Robin. Good morning. Our first reading is Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 48. He told them, this is what it is written. The Messiah will suffer and raise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of his sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Second reading is Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 32. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported we found the, jail, found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. 
We give you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you're able to stand. So the operator asked, oh, are you Norma's daughter? Oh, no, not at all. I'm Norma. I'm Norma Finley. I'm in room 302. Just nobody tells me anything. No one tells me anything. Friends, as Christians, we're called to share. It's uncomfortable. It makes us worried. It makes us, un- it makes us feel a little strange. Yet we're called to share. You're the best news in the world. I keep it to yourself. And yet we've been trained in our culture, I fear at times, even in church, to keep it quiet. I thought about it, but we didn't show a clip from the movie Fight Club, which is really a brutal, rough, crass movie. And yet when I watched it, I couldn't stop thinking about it for weeks, years ago. Fight Club starring Edward Norton and the lady says he's a good looking guy, Brad Pitt. Yeah, they're in the movie there together. 
And yet there are two rules about Fight Club. See, these guys, they had such a rough time at work that guys would meet after work and just punch each other selfless, senseless, I should say, until one of them couldn't get up. There are two rules for Fight Club that jump out right at the bat. Ready for them? Here's the first rule of Fight Club. You do not talk about Fight Club. You ready for the second rule that shows up? Second rule of Fight Club is this. You do not talk about Fight Club. And yet for church, we often have that idea. We don't talk about Jesus. And yet Jesus, just before he enters heaven, says, you will be my witnesses of these things. The apostles couldn't keep their mouths shut. It's fascinating, the apostles. They are arrested and thrown in the prison for sharing their faith. The angel comes in the middle of the night, busts them out of jail, sends them out into the street. Guess what they do? They preach. Now between us, it's a little stupid, don't you think? We got in prison for sharing the faith, our faith. Why in the world are we going back out there? I mean, if I was going to play it safe, I'd go home, watch some TV, catch up on my TV or something, but not at all. Instead, they're out there sharing what they believed again. Something changed in them where they couldn't keep quiet. Something changed in them where they couldn't keep quiet. And maybe it's about the fact that they would they wanted to obey God rather than men. Because the apostles, when they were thrown into prison there, as you can read about in the book of Acts chapter 5, they're arrested, they're berated by these leading officials of the Sanhedrin, especially the Sadducees. Later on, we can read that they were beaten before their release. I think that's in verse 40 in Acts 5. That they spent nights, in, or night, well, most of the night in prison. Who wants to put up with that? Something changed in their hearts where God had moved and worked within them. From the Voice of the Martyrs, the January 2017 newsletter, they relay a story from a pastor shared from an Islamic country which will remain unnamed in part to protect both the pastor as well as the woman who the story is about. Shani, her name is spelled S-H-A-N-I in English, Shani was a member of a church. Her father, her husband, pardon me, was one of the leaders of that church. One night, in the middle of the night, the local police came and arrested her husband. She was terrified. They took her husband away. Now, her husband was a strong leader, but Shani did not feel at all strong in her faith. She felt insecure about what she believed. But she knew that if they came for her husband, they would probably come for her. So, as she prayed, she said, Dear God, please don't allow them to find me. Police, that is. I can't handle torture. I can't handle a jail cell. I'm not strong like my husband. If they torture me, I'll probably give up all the names of the people in this church. I might even deny my faith completely. She prayed that prayer and went to sleep. Then at 6 o'clock in the morning, a knock at the door. She looked out the window. There are two policemen on the front stoop waiting to take her away. God, what are you doing? Shani prayed with anger. What are you doing? Whatever happens now, God, if I, if I spill the beans for other people, it's all your fault. They took Shani away to prison. Threw her into a cell without lights, no food for the rest of the day, and it smelled like a sewer. She wasn't used to that. She came from a very rich family. This was about the worst you could get for Shani. All day, she's in that cell by herself. No communication, no light. Suddenly, at 2 o'clock in the morning, guards her at the door. Wake up! And they took her to the interrogation room. She would later find out what it was. The interrogator looked at her. He's angry. It's the middle of the night. He looks like he's had a long day. So he sat down across the table from Shani. He said, why do you talk about Jesus and Muslims? Don't you know it's illegal here? You are not permitted to evangelize. In other words, you're not permitted to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Shani, she stared at the angry interrogator, started to pray, dear God, Dear Lord Jesus. And she felt this peace in her. We may call it the peace that passes all understanding, but she suddenly felt this peace. Remember, she's in jail. She's terrified. She looked at the interrogator and said, I have a right to evangelize. She said, I'm happy that I'm evangelizing. We're supposed to evangelize. This is a commandment from Jesus. Everyone needs to hear this good news. You need to hear this good news too. God sent me here to tell you about Jesus. You're a poor man. I feel bad for you. You don't have any peace. You don't have any joy. You don't have any hope. You don't even know why you're alive. The only way the truth is Jesus Christ. You're an interrogator now, but one day you're going to stand before the ultimate judge, Jesus Christ, and he's going to examine you. Without him, there is no hope for you. And Jesus is going to ask you 
why don't you do this to my servants? And the interrogator was shocked by her bold words. I see, he replied. I know exactly who you are. Your punishment has just increased. Take her back to her cell. And back she went. <laughs> Sniffing of the sewer smells. Dark. No food. Sleepless times. Terror filled. The, the, the strength and the peace she felt in the room seemed to have just disappeared while she was in that cell, shivering by herself. She spent that long day intermittent sleep occurring. And then at 2 o'clock in the morning, a full 24 hours later, the knock came at the door. The guard came, the guards came I should say, took her back to the interrogation room. She saw the interrogator, she filled with dread, and suddenly she felt peace flood within her, and suddenly she shared again with the interrogator about the same thing. He was angered, said, your, your, your sentence is just double. Take her back to her room. Back to the cell she went. Another day, no light, sewer stench, no food, now no water. Two o'clock comes. The guards are there again. They take her back to the interrogation room. The interrogator looks furious. And as she's filled with terror, the terror suddenly becomes peace as she prays, and suddenly she's able to share again with the interrogator. In anger, he sends her back to her room. But now she's fearful for her life. Because she knows they could easily have her killed. Killing women is a simple thing in this country. She went back to her room. There was no sleep to come. Hours passed, and then around five or six in the morning, she hears another knock at the door. The door opens, and she sees the interrogator at the door. I'm going to die. Is what goes through her mind. The interrogator looked at her and said these words Don't worry, I will not harm you. I want to ask you for a favor. Would you pray for me tonight? There are tears in his eyes as he walked into her room. How do you know that God sent you here to, at this particular time in my life? The interrogator asked. The past few days I've been going through hell. How did you know that my life is so crazy, so messed up? I tried everything in my religion and could never find peace. I learned today that the only Savior is Jesus Christ. Please help me to be saved. The interrogator stayed in Shani's cell for three hours. She talked with him about faith. He became a Christian that day. He had Shani and her husband released on the condition that they would secretly disciple him. In other words, help him become a Christian. What would happen if she kept her mouth shut? And yet for her, it was more about obeying God than listening to what anybody else would have her say. We all too quickly keep our mouths shut. It's hard to share your faith. It's difficult to open our mouths. If you feel that fear, that sounds like Shani had. Scriptures tell us in 1 John that perfect love drives out fear. Perfect love drives out fear. That's 1 John 4, 18. Maybe in the midst of the terror and facing death, she realized the only one she could cling to was Jesus Christ. And holding on to that perfect love, it drove out the fear. Shani couldn't keep quiet. See, Shani couldn't keep quiet. And thankfully, the folks who shared faith with us didn't keep quiet. Who's that person who first shared with you faith? Most of you had an ego right through your head, didn't you? Who was that person who first shared faith with you? really share. For me, it was Gary Schultz, youth group leader, growing up. Thankfully, he didn't keep his mouth shut. The church I grew up in, as goofy as it could be at times, they at least had a purpose for sharing the gospel. The trap we can fall into is we can miss that mark. The story goes that there was a life-saving station just off the coast. And the life-saving station was this beat-up shack of a place. They were ready at a moment's notice to leave that shack and get out into the waters in case there were choppy waters or a boat capsized or whatnot to save people who had gone overboard, to save the ship, and hopefully maybe save parts of the cargo that might be on that ship. Lives were saved, but because it was a really small outfit with a beat-up boat with holes in it, the shack was just barely there, they had a hard time getting volunteers. It was difficult. 
save as many lives as they could. But soon the reputation for this life-saving station grew. So much so that according to this old story, that it became popular to be part of the life-saving station. It went from those weird folks who were out there in the worst of weather, soon, wow, did you hear about them? Did you hear about them? They're doing great things over there. Let's go over there. Mm, next thing you know, there are more and more people being part of this life-saving station. <laughs> the beautiful thing was, now they were able to save more and more people. And the storms came. Some folks actually had a night off. It was a beautiful thing to be able to not have to work every storm. As more people joined this life-saving station, they found that the shack really wasn't all that suitable for all the people that were there. So they started planning about how they could make a nicer place. They went from having this shack to selling there to have plans for this multi-million dollar facility to make sure they could save people's lives. You wanted the building to be warm whenever folks came in cold off the, out of the water. You wanted to make sure that they had the best clothes possible. You wanted to make sure they had plenty of proper lighting outside, let alone inside. Soon, it was the state of the art life-saving station. It was so beautiful that more and more people wanted to go. They had a great time together. They, they had great fellowship time as they mingled, they'd have their parties, they'd make sure they had their fundraisers. It was great, it was wonderful. But as more people joined, and more people joined, it became less of a mission to be intentional about saving lives. Because it was so comfortable inside the life-saving station. Those couches, oh, who wants to get up? And my goodness, the temperature controls 70 degrees in here and all the time? Oh, who wants to go out there when it's 25 degrees out in the water? We'll stay inside here. Some of you can go out and save boats. We'll keep the fires warm. And yet, they soon stop thinking about the folks coming in. Because the floors, you don't want to get wet dirty people stepping on our new carpets. We can't have them stepping on the couch there. We better keep them out of the refrigerator because you know there are things in there that we only want members to have. Matter of fact, those boats are really nice that we have. We enjoy using them for daily pleasures. Maybe we should get some other beat up boats so we can pick up folks around the storm. There are a few people who really are very dedicated to life-saving efforts, but many folks who belong to the life-saving station didn't even go out when the storms were bad. And then the storm to end all storms came. The mother of all storms suddenly hit the coast and it wiped out a large vessel. People were in the water and sadly many died that night. There are a few hardy souls who went out into the water from the life-saving station to save others, but most folks stayed inside. We'll prepare the place for when you bring them in. Except when they brought in the stragglers from the boats, they said, please stand over there on the linoleum. No, we don't want to get the couches wet. We have some spare clothes over there. I know it doesn't really fit you, and some of it has holes, but we'll let you wear that as they wore their nice warm outfits. Many people died with that storm. Many people were saved. But the next meeting, it came to a head because some of the folks who were part of the life saving station said, that was bad. We had all these dirty, wet folks coming in off the storm. And look at the mess they made here in the life-saving station. And then there were others who were there saying, are you kidding me? Remember, we're called a life-saving station. We're here to save people's lives. That's the whole purpose for that group originally. What do you mean that we can't do other things to help people? No, no, no. We, you know, we, it's okay if we leave them outside. It's 25 degrees, but we don't want them to get the couch messes. We don't want them to get the carpeting in the soil. We don't want anything askew in here. But we're a life-saving station. That night, it became more and more heat. Finally, they had a vote. What will we do? Are we going to remain a life-saving station that will save people's lives, or are we here to meet together? And that night, they voted to meet together. They became a social club. The few people who had gone out into the storm to save people's lives, they left. They bought a shack down by the water's edge. They bought some of the old boats that they used to use. They bought them back and brought them over. When the terrible storms would come, those few hardy souls that were in that small shack on the side of the shore, they'd go out and try to save as many people as they could, but they could see up on the hillside the well-lit, beautifully warm, life-saving station, loud music coming from it as people celebrated inside as other people perished. The trap we can fall into, friends, in, in church in our own lives is this. We can turn what we do here in our church lives and our own personal life as though we're part of that life-saving station. 
but we can't open our mouths. And yet, with Jesus, we're called to be people who can't keep quiet. That doesn't mean you have to be rude and obnoxious. Because if you're going to share with love with others, it's not rude or obnoxious. Except it sounds like when Shani shared. Most of the time when it's rude or obnoxious, it's the other person hearing it that way. You remember last week's assignment? Part of it was this. To show love to someone who belong, who's a Christian and somebody who doesn't go to church anywhere. Tell them why you did what you did. In other words, tell them that for me it was because of the love of Jesus. Tuesday is garbage day and this week was recycling day here for the church. Tiffany, the last day as our custodian was Wednesday. Now I walk by the garbage all the time to come into the church and the pile of recycling, especially with cardboard, was getting higher and higher and higher. It was like five or six feet tall. It was, just, it was a mountain of cardboard recyclables. So Tuesday, I realized, well, if I'm going to get that assignment, I probably ought to be doing something to help Tiffany. It sounds like this is right for her, since a lot of the cardboard came from my office. So I started to tear down all the boxes, put them all inside one large box. That box was so heavy, I could barely carry it out to the curbside for recycling. But I moved it all the whole way out front, dropped it off there, came back into the church. Now, normally, what we ought to do as Christians is keep it quiet. You know, your right hand should know what your left hand's doing. Let the good you do keep it secret. Like with, with prayer, we ought to enter our prayer closet instead of showing off. But some goofball named Brian Keller, the pastor, decided he gave an assignment last week. And so, Tiffany came into the church that Tuesday. I saw Tiffany, and this is how it felt for me. Her version of it is a completely different story. But it felt like this to me when I told her why I did it. That Tiffany, I uh, took out the uh, recycling out to the curb. And Tiffany, I just wanted to tell you, uh, the reason why I did it was, uh, well, I gave homework at church last week, you know. And uh, what I really, um, well, uh, 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 what I really wanted to do, uh, well, I took out the recycling, Tiffany, because I had this assignment from church, because uh, the love of Jesus, and that's what it felt like. Her version is completely different, but that's what it felt like. Now, you may look at me and say, preacher, you're supposed to have this all together. <laughs> Pardon me, that was me laughing at that idea. I don't. It's weird sharing what you believe at times. I hope you took that assignment to heart and actually did something kind for somebody who's in church, somebody who isn't a Christian, and told them why. You may think it's strange or goofy, but it's a stepping stone for the ability for us to tell people what we believe. You don't instantly suddenly go from sitting in the pews to suddenly being all here to preach. Rarely does that happen. We read about it in the Bible a few times. But even the Apostle Paul spent years of training before he started really preaching. The good news is sharing the faith. Most of the time we take steps. That's why the assignment was given last week. It's a step. So if you didn't do the assignment this last week, I encourage you to do it. Do something kind for somebody who goes to church. Do something out of love for somebody who doesn't, who isn't a Christian, and tell them why. You don't have to do it like I did. Oh, I was what it is. Why? I encourage you to do that. Now, if you did do it last week, beautiful, because the assignment this week is twofold. One, read chapter twenty-five of experiencing God, and two. And then, of course, go to your growth group. But two, with one of the two people you shared, why you showed them love from last week, follow up with them to talk about your faith. Instead of just saying, I did it out of love, tell them about your faith story. And for maybe for you, I would suggest work on why you came to faith. When Jesus talked with the disciples in Luke 24, as we read this morning, you are witnesses of these things. Now, they saw Jesus rise from the dead. They saw Jesus die on the cross. They saw those things firsthand. The witness that you can be is about what has Jesus done in your life. Why would you even get up this early on a Sunday morning? Really? You're supposed to sleep in on Sundays. That's what the world tells me. So why? You can be a witness about what your faith means to you. You know, this chair to steal mine. Mine's from another day. Wow. What's faith mean to you? It's your story. You get to be a witness of your story and how Jesus touched you. That's your assignment for this week. Because we're called to be people who can't keep quiet. 
we're called to be folks who share. I mean, you and I, we're witnesses of how Jesus has touched our lives. But we're called to obey God rather than that. As dangerous and scary as that could be at times, we're called to share. The apostles risked and then received beatings for what they did. And they went home and were joyful because they got to suffer. Talk about folks who are known this incredible love of God. Finally, think about that person who shared faith with you. What would have happened if they hadn't shared? Where would you be? Imagine. You might just be that person in someone else's life who changes their destiny forever. What's beautiful is it's really not about us, it's about God moving and working through us. And part giving us that strength and courage to be people who can't keep quiet. So, my friends, would you pray with me? I encourage you, at least is how we pray at the end of the sermon here, is I encourage you to hold up your hands as we talk with God. Palms up towards heaven, almost as though you're waiting for God to put something in your hands. And I encourage you to repeat after me. The prayer will be on the screen behind me if that helps you, but it's better if we close our eyes and pray. So my friends, let us pray. Lord God, loving Father, Lord God, I love you. I want others to know and love you. Grant me courage. Thank you that you love me. You've loved me enough that Jesus died for me. You love me enough that Jesus died for me. I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. My friends, let's continue to worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
part of that is letting folks know why we do what we do. It's incredible news that Jesus died for us, that God loves us so much that his own son would die for us, that he rose from the dead, we have hope for life now and life eternal. Why would we keep quiet? And yet, maybe we've been trained, we've been told, shh, don't talk about that. And that's not what we hear in the scriptures. We ought to be people who can't keep quiet. Share with love. But don't use that as some excuse to not share. Why would God want to use us? Angels would be more effective. Why doesn't Jesus just show up in the sky? Buy some, I don't know, the good year bloom for a day or something to pronounce. No. God desires to use us, which means you and me. As weak, as imperfect, as flawed as we are, he wants to use us. Thanks be to God. As you leave here today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.